Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to July 1983 to get the latest Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games. We have the first part of our games creation feature. We look back at early and not so early CRL games and review some newer material. But first, it's back into the time machine in July 1983. Any Spectrum owner will know the name of the best-selling Scramble Club. Everyone except, strangely enough, a company called Spectrum Games. Until recently they had been selling a game with the same name for the VIC-20, with a very similar logo. Melbourne House, the makers of the Spectrum Classic, have threatened legal action, and the company have agreed to remove the title. 3,000 Spectrums have been stolen from a warehouse in Hornsey, with an estimated value of £380,000. They were being stored there by a distributor prism, ready for shipping to retailers. Four people faked an accident outside the warehouse, and as an employee came to help, the gang produced a sawn-off shotgun and forced their way in. Two lorries were then filled with the machines and driven off before police could arrive. With the arrival of the new Sinclair machine, the good old ZX81 has seen demand drop and stock slowly coming to a standstill. WH Smith have confirmed that they are not stocking any new titles for the machine, but will continue to support it in other areas. Quicksilver has become one of the first UK software companies to open an office in America. Quicksilver Incorporated, as it will be called, is based in San Antonio, Texas, and has been set up to organise distribution of titles across America and Canada for the Timex Sinclair 2000, the American version of the Spectrum. And that's the news for July 1983, and now on to the top selling games. Flight simulation is still high in the charts, and yes it is called that, thanks to a member of the WASP forums for pointing that out, and it isn't in fact called the Flight Simulator, which is what I referred to it in an earlier episode. Surprisingly few new titles this month entering the charts, with old favourites holding their ground. Jetpack is still fighting off Penetrator, The Hobbit and Transylvanian Tower for the top 5 spot, with 3D tanks coming back into the mix. Horace Ghost Skiing is also there. And so is our Didums from Yajin. And that's how the top selling titles are looking for July 1983. If you were not gifted with the logic and patience required to write machine code games, you had three options. First you could use BASIC, but as time moved on, that route was not really acceptable anymore. Secondly, you could use a compiler to convert your basic game into machine code. This had varying degrees of success, but was limited due to the technicalities of the compiler and the fact that they often couldn't use certain basic commands. Lastly, you could buy one of the new game creation packages that were slowly arriving. And if you believed the hype that came with them, you could have your own machine code game ready to sell in hours. The three main contenders were Games Designer from Quicksilver, Herg from Melbourne House, and Arcade Creator from Argus Press. There were others that either used existing engines, like the 3D Driller type games, or could only be used to make isometric games, like 3D Game Creator. For this feature though we'll be looking at the first three, before moving on 30 years and taking a look at some newer packages in next episode's feature. First up is Games Designer, released in 1983 by Quicksilver. This entry, so the advertisement said, allowed you to create everything you need to make your own game. It used an easy to use menu system that allowed you access to every aspect of the game and to play and save the game for later use. There were several preset game styles to use, and these were limited to variations of Invaders, Asteroids or Defender. In other words, you could shoot upwards, sidewards or in any direction. Once you had decided which type of game to make, you then had to implement your idea, design the sprites, set the sound and create attack waves, etc. Sprites were edited using a standard grid editor and each sprite could have four frames of animation. You had to make the player ship, the bullets, the aliens, or whatever it is you wanted to shoot, and explosions. There was no option for a background other than scrolling stars, which was set in another part of the menu. Once you had all your graphics done, next you set the attack patterns. This was done by drawing lines with the keyboard to lay out the route the aliens would take. The 
configuration menu allowed you to set the game format, as mentioned previously, background colours and foreground colours, special effects and sounds. The special effects really just switched the scrolling star fields on and off. The sound option allowed you to set sounds for various actions, including killing aliens and shooting. Sliders allowed you to change various frequencies and filters to produce a range of sounds that somehow all sounded the same. And could often be found in other Quicksilver games. The most complex part was defining how each attack wave worked, which sprite to use, what the movement pattern was, what the maximum number of sprites there were in each attack wave, etc. etc. This was the meat of the game and set out how everything fitted together. Once all that was done, you could play the game at any point, just to check how things were going. Once you had spent hours doing all of this, you could then save the game out. But now comes the really bad point. You could not play the game on its own without first loading the game designer package in. This obviously meant that you could not sell it. It all seemed a bit of a waste of time really, because you could only give your games to people that had the game's creation package. This package is fun to play about with, but can't really be used to create professional games because of the limitations. And now onto Herg by Melbourne House, released in 1984. Another option for budding games designers, or so you'd think. The advertisement claimed you could design your own game in minutes, but that wasn't strictly true. The demo games that came with it were hardly brilliant, which set the tone for the rest of the program. The menu system was tricky to use, using the cursor keys to move up and down and the zero key to select an option. Some options had multiple levels and there was no quick way back to the top level. You had to just keep selecting back to whichever the previous menu was. Creating a game involved the usual things, starting with the option to load your own background in the form of a screen, or just leave it blank. The game variation section were just slots that you could save any specific settings in case you wanted to make another game with the same basic settings. The player and sprite sections had the same functionality. You can build the sprite, animate it, set the screen limitations, the speed and the animation, and the collision rules. The editor had useful options like mirror, or to use an existing shape. This helped when creating animations and you didn't have to redraw it again. When each section was complete, you had the option to move to the next stage, which was helpful as it guided you through the whole process. The movement patterns were easy to create and you could have up to eight different ones. Once all this was in place, and just for the record, adding a player, ship and bullet and just one alien took over two hours, you could try out your masterpiece. Having spent so long with this package, the results were less than inspiring. I did not create a title page, or set out the rules for the next frame or stage of the game, I just wanted to shoot something and see how it looked. Sadly, even this caused problems. No matter what I did, I could not get the player to shoot anything. The final nail in the coffin was the fact that the games created with Herg could not be run alone, they could only be used from within the program, just like Games Designer. So, after three hours of faffing about, reading the manual, going through the tediously slow menu system, this is the best result I had. It's no wonder I moved on to something else. Finally onto the last package, Arcade Creator, released in 1986. This was released two years after ERG and three years after Games Designer. So would that time finally give us a decent application? The standard menu provides the usual set of tools that every game designer needs. The UDG editor allows you to build graphics for the background or platforms. There is no animation nor special features like collapsing floors or conveyor belts, just fixed 8 pixel squares. The sound generator was quite nice and could be used to make some interesting noises. You can save up to 8 of these sounds for use in the games for things like firing or jumping. The sprite designer was painfully slow, and it took ages just to create a player ship. Once that was done, you could then add it to the sprite list and put in some animation. Again, this was very slow. Next we came to the screen designer, and at this point I got the feeling the program was geared more towards platform games. 
Here you could pick up any of the four banks of UDGs you previously created and build them up into a screen. Nowhere on the menu could I see any way of testing the game, there was just an option to load and save. Upon further investigation it seemed that this is how it worked. You have to create all your data and then save it to tape. To actually put it all together and look at it, you have to load in another program. This second program leads you through the process of putting all the data together by using a series of fixed questions. You can specify things like bonuses, scoring, number of aliens, etc, etc, before choosing your images and setting things like player and explosion animations. This is such a long process, especially after you have spent a good hour or so creating all the data in the first place and you still haven't seen how it's going to look. Finally, when you have finished everything and you've, all the questions are done, you can save it to tape. At this point you can load it back in as a standalone game, which is a bonus, and see what you've created. But here's where the problem is. If you've made one single mistake anywhere along the line, if there's a sound you don't like, if there's an image you don't like, you can't fix it there and then. You have to go back into the editor, load all your data in, make the changes, save all the data out, load the compilation package back in, load your data back in, go through all the process and questions again, then save it out, then play it. What a huge waste of time that is. After what seemed like a lifetime of getting nowhere, I decided to see what the demo games were like, just to make sure it wasn't me that was doing something wrong. When I loaded the game, it reminded me of one of those worst ever game compilations. The game was rubbish in every aspect. It was at this point that I decided not to continue with this program. It just wasn't worth the effort. Even if you could play the games on their own, no one would bother because they were so rubbish. So that was the best the world could offer in the way of game creation utilities back in the 80s. A bit poor really, but join us next episode when we put things right and take a look at the newer game creation programs. This is Glug Glug, released by CRL in 1984. This was probably one of those games that slipped under the radar from what was then a mediocre games company. It's a kind of cross between jetpack and scuba dive. You control a diver, tethered to a boat that has to dive to the bottom of the ocean and collect three items of treasure. Under the waves there are all kinds of sea life that can cause instant death. Shoals of fish meander about, jellyfish flow aimlessly around and crabs patrol the bottom of the seabed. There's even a shark in there. Each type of creature has its own movement pattern, making the game interesting, especially when there's a mixture on screen. The hardest ones are the small shoals of fish that track your movement, causing you to continuously dodge and shoot. Yes, you've got a gun and you can shoot things, which helps. Once all of the three items have collected, you can move on to the next level and a different mix of creatures appear. Later levels also see mines, fixed to the seabed with a chain which you cannot move through. This narrows down the playing area and makes things a little bit more tricky. This is a nice little game that really deserves more credit than it got. It's a quick pick up and play game, fun and challenging. Why not give it a try? CRL developed as a company and went on to produce how can I say this nicely? Some average games, the height of which is probably Toseti, and a range of adventures based on classic horror stories like Dracula and Frankenstein. Amongst them there were a few good games, the most weird of which was probably Ninja Hamster. This beat-em-up focused on a hamster out to get revenge by fighting a series of equally odd characters, and takes the form of a traditional player versus computer or player versus player combat game. The range of attacks can be assigned to keys and include low kicks, high kicks, punches, jumping, etc etc. The game begins with your hamster up against a rat, or to give him his full name, Sinister Rat. Once you've completed the round and beaten your opponent, the next one comes along. There are health meters on each side of the screen, which are depleted if a successful blow is landed, and rises again slowly if there isn't. Once the hamster dispatches Sinister Rat, up comes the Lizard of Death to try his hand. The opponents get progressive and more difficult, forcing you, as a hamster, to use blocking moves and take different approaches to attacks. 
as your everyday hamster does. If you are a good player, unlike myself, you can get to fight Mean Monkey, Barmy Bee, Crazy Cat, Perilous Parrot, Mad Dog and finally Loony Lobster. Or you could just use a cheat. This is a good game that I suspect will take on a whole different light if there are two players involved. As it is though, it's got nice graphics and sound, controls are quite responsive, and the difficulty is just about right. If you like fighting games, ignore the fact it's a hamster and give it a go. For this episode's new game review, I'm going to do something different. It's a sort of new old game review. Got that? There have been many Pac-Man clones for the Spectrum, some better than others and some absolutely terrible. But what if you could play the real arcade Pac-Man on your Spectrum? Well now you can. In 2011 Simon Owen devised a clever piece of code that actually emulates the arcade machine, uses the real arcade ROMs and plays the real arcade game on your Spectrum. You have to get the ROMs yourself from wherever you want to get them from, <coughs> not, not mentioning any names. Specifically you need four files. Once you have these files you put them in the same folder as the files from the emulator that you've downloaded and run the make.bat file. In less than a second you will now have a new file called packemuzx.tap. This file you can now load into your favourite emulator or convert it with one of the many utilities so it can be used on a real plus 2A or plus 3 spectrum. Once loaded, you get the full arcade game. Not a clone, not a copy, the real thing. It's amazing to play this game on such old hardware, but a real thrill that it can actually be done. Just imagine you can play a real arcade game on your spectrum. If you're a Pac-Man fan, then this is as good as it gets. This is a really, really good achievement. It just makes you wonder what could possibly be coming next. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help making the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon. <laughs>